Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Travis Humble. I'm from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'm representing the Quantum Computing Institute. This is an organization within the laboratory trying to leverage all of our capabilities to address this exciting new question of how can quantum computing help us advance scientific discovery. Here's a panoramic view of Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, you can see it's a very large complex. Uh, over there on the, the upper left is actually the spallation neutron source, one of the brightest sources of neutrons in the world used for characterizing materials. Just off to the right is the high flux isotope re reactor, one of the only sources of several rare medical isotopes in the world. And dead center in this picture in the large busy area is the location of the high performance computing facility. So of course, high performance computing is an incredibly important part of our capabilities for supporting scientific discovery and innovation. As many of you know, we've recently made the transition from the Titan system to the Summit system. That of course has been uh, very celebrated at Oak Ridge. Here's a picture from June 2018. These guys look really happy. Uh, in the front is the director of the laboratory, Thomas Zachariah. He's taking the uh, Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry, on a tour of the Summit system. But if you look in the back, and I had to perfectly pause this frame, you'll see Jeff Nichols. He is the ALD, Associate Laboratory Director for Computing. He's not smiling. That's not because Jeff's not happy. I'm absolutely sure he's happy. He knows this is a tremendous success. Thomas is about to announce that uh, Summit is the world's smartest uh, computing system. But I really think what Jeff is thinking about is what's, what comes next. Okay, how do we keep pushing the envelope? Well, what comes after the Summit system? And I know for a fact they're already thinking about that. My role right now is to try and imagine systems beyond this, systems in the 2025 and beyond uh, era and time. So planning for computing, of course, is very um, always difficult. Uh, currently, though, there are some new challenges that are coming up that aren't quite uh, familiar. One of these, of course, is the uh, dreaded end of Moore's law. Uh, you can see here on the left an example of a single atom transistor. I like to think of this as kind of Moore's cul-de-sac, okay? This is where the law ends. We really can't divide a single atom up e any further. In this particular example, that's a single phosphorus atom laying on a uh, surface of silicon. Uh, it's in between two aluminum leads. Depending on the state of that atom, current actually flows from one side to the other. So it's a spin-dependent tunneling process. But it's still classical. This is still conventional computing. I can still imagine building up a network of transistors around this technology. On the right, however, is the concept that if I take that individual atom and I actually cause it to interfere with itself, I will create a fringe pattern. And this fringe pattern means that in places where it's lightly colored, there's a probability that the atom actually is located there. And in places where it's dark blue, it doesn't exist. And you can see that there's an oscillation here. And this is not classical. This is quantum mechanics. Now, here's Richard Feynman. He's very happy. He's figured out a new idea of how that effect, quantum mechanics, could actually be used for simulating nature. And so he, he makes the point here that nature itself, we know, is quantum mechanical. That's been over 100 years worth of physics research into this area. And if we want to make simulations of nature, like we do at Oak Ridge, we're gonna to have to think about how to leverage these quantum mechanical effects in our, in our computations. So what is quantum computing, at least as defined today? Fundamentally, it's just computing using quantum mechanics. Now, here's the rub. There's a lot of terminology that comes into play. Terminology that, unless you've had a physics background, isn't gonna be very familiar. But I'll try to give it in, uh, term in uh, phrases that might actually relate to things you're used to. So for example, in the top, you can see the typical picture of the hydrogen atom. This is what I certainly learned in grade school. It's this solar system model. There's a uh, nucleus in the center, a proton, and around that is this little orbiting planet, the electron. The truth is, that's not what an atom looks like. The truth is, an atom looks like this distribution that you see down here, where again, the light areas represent the probability of this particle to exist, and the dark areas uh, for it not to. Quantum mechanics uses that representation to define uh, value, to define information, to define a computational state. Quantum computing is all about manipulating the wave function. There's a well-known equation for this, Schrodinger's equation. It's a, a differential equation. Um, 
Everything in quantum computing comes from this equation. If you can solve this differential equation efficiently, you can actually perform quantum computation. Now we know, however, from theory that there is no good conventional way to solve this equation efficiently. Instead, we've actually got to use quantum systems to perform that calculation. So the basic requirements of a quantum computer then, I have to have some system of well-characterized qubits. Qubits are the quantum version of a bit. It's the notional amount of inf information that I can represent. You see here a sphere where the north and south poles represent the values of zero and one. That's the normal binary logic. But a qubit can actually exist at any point on the surface of this sphere. And in fact, there's an infinite number of those points. So right away, you can tell that quantum computing gives me access to new states of information that I never had access to before. So I need a system of these things. I need a register. I need to be able to address that register using operations. For example, I have to initialize them. Setting all your data to zero to start your calculation is a fundamental part of performing a good calculation. I have to have a set of operations that I can use to actually implement the logic. Now, in conventional computing, I normally think of the logic in terms of a Boolean algebra. In quantum computing, it turns out it's actually an operator algebra. So again, it's a more complex system of equations, but it's performing something very similar. At the same time, I have to be able to maintain the state of this information long enough to complete my calculation. It turns out this is where it gets really difficult. At the, so far, everything I've talked about is just definition. But actually demonstrating quantum computing requires us to have control over that Schrodinger equation in a way that exceeds our current capabilities. I have to be able to measure the system. This is how I actually generate output. And then, of course, there's some architectural concerns about moving data around. There's presently a race for quantum technology to try and realize these ideas in many different implementations. Uh, two of the leading candidates right now are superconducting electronics uh, operating at cryogenic temperatures and uh, individual trapped ions, uh, typically uh, using electromagnetic fields. There's also demonstrations using silicon uh, where the individual electrons within a silicon substrate are manipulated. Uh, and then other more exotic forms that we haven't yet realized. But this is a worldwide effort. Everybody is trying to be first to demonstrate a scalable approach to realizing quantum computing, in part because of this vision of Feynman that we can actually perform new types of calculations that we never could before. So the current state is that we do in fact have things called quantum processing units. The truth of the matter is these are normally physics experiments wrapped up in uh, some packaging that helps improve the controllability. Right now, the number of qubits, the register sizes, are anywhere from zero, for technologies that haven't been realized yet, up to around 22, at least documented in the literature. The gates, the operations, have fidelities on the order of three nines of probability of success. That means I can do about 1,000 of them before I hit a significant error. Uh, but I have two qubit gate fidelities. This is doing logic between register elements that's about a factor of a 10 less. There's limited connectivity, good addressability. These are important for designing chips, like the examples that you see here, but it limits how much programmability I actually have. When I add all of these factors together, currently I can do very small scale applications that are limited by the number of qubits that I have as well as the noise that's in these gates. But I can do them. And I can do them in part because of the research that's been going on for the last 25 years has now turned into prototype systems that are actually publicly available uh, through many different mechanisms uh, being offered by vendors. Uh, they typically uh, adhere to a client-server interaction model. So I, as the client, log into the system, push my job over. It, processes on one of these devices sends me back a result. This is a very loose integration, certainly not something that I see a high performance computing center taking that approach to programming, but it's at least a start to get us developing applications. Well, this has turned out to be uh, quite a success story for quantum computing lately. Many of you may have heard there's now a national quantum initiative signed into law uh, just before the uh, winter holidays by the president, 
intended to accelerate quantum research within the United States. Now, among many different things, uh, Department of Energy is expected to start up its own programs in this area. And there's, in fact, a National Quantum Coordination Office to coordinate efforts across government agencies. There's subcommittees of the National uh, Science and Technical Council, and also a Quantum Economic Development Consortium, which has recently been established through NIST in order to provide stability within the supply chain. This is a pretty big jump from the last slide. The last slide said, I've got some prototype demonstrations of quantum computing concepts. This slide is saying it's now a national priority. So our role in all of this as a national laboratory is to be an international leader in the field of quantum computing. And I'd like to explain to you what that actually means. First off, we have to advance the technology itself all the way up from the atoms to the applications. But in particular, those applications are incredibly important for our scientific discovery. We have to be able to figure out how quantum computing is going to integrate into our existing workflows and how we can leverage that in ways that, uh, on, with problems that we're not yet able to tackle with conventional approaches. Of course, this ties into our national priorities, including discovery and innovation and energy security. And we want to be able to transfer this uh, knowledge into the public good. We're making investments in infrastructure. Uh, three systems that I would highlight at the moment. One of these is in partnership with IBM to gain access to their general purpose quantum processor, uh, IBM Q. Uh, we're actually a hub within that network where we're partnering with other Department of Energy laboratories to actually develop applications on this uh, gate-based model of quantum computing, which we can then apply to our scientific discovery. Similarly, we're partnering with D-Wave, who makes a special purpose processor tailored to optimization problems. And there we have access to that system, also partnering with our collaborators to develop applications for scientific discovery. And then finally, there's numerical simulation. So just conventional numerical analysis of how quantum systems work. We've actually bought a system from Atos, which develops a numerical simulator uh, that we have now put on site. However, because of the challenges in simulating these types of systems, that is not a system that's going to scale over time and currently uh, tops out around 30 qubits in terms of its simulation capability. So let me just kind of walk you through how these pieces go together and how we interact with them. So this is the example using the IBM Q system. On the far left, you'll see the materials. Okay, and this is, this is really where the quantum mechanics is important. Uh, these particular types of qubits are called transmons. They use Cooper pair electrons and these uh, superconducting Josephson junctions. You build up a circuit of those to create a device. It's integrated into an electronics package. You can characterize that in terms of the individual register elements and the gate operations. And all of that has to be put into a system. You can see here the example of the cryogenic uh, refrigeration system that's, that's necessary. For our users, though, this actually looks more like a Python program. We've actually developed a language, in, and, and IBM has as well, in which you can program these systems just using Python, developing some of the basic concepts of initializing registers, applying gate operations, and generating readout. So very early days, but extremely powerful for developing algorithms. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's essential requirements for what a quantum computer must be able to do. We can go through and do an analysis of the devices that we have access to, um, quantify these metrics, if you will, uh, not necessarily compare them, because at the moment, all of the systems are so vastly different that it's difficult to actually make a baseline. But it gives us insight into how the technology itself is developing and whether this year is any better than last year. Now, in terms of what I think quantum computing is going to be useful for, I'm going to call out three specific use cases for scientific computing. The first we're already doing. This is physical sciences. This is chemistry, high energy physics, materials. There, I'm actually give you some demonstrations in a moment of ways we're using quantum computing to solve these problems today. They may not yet be competitive with conventional approaches, certainly not competitive with high performance computing codes, but we're at the point now where we can start thinking of a path where they could be. In the three to five year range, though, is where data sciences come in. This is machine learning, AI, places where quantum computing, which again is a probabilistic model of computation, can be used for inference problems. However, there's an I.O. problem right now that prevents us from using these in real settings, 
where we have to provide sufficient amounts of data to the processor in a sufficient amount of time to be competitive. And then finally, there's applied sciences. So imagine this is verification and validation of engineering designs, solving partial differential equations, monitoring flows. I think that's probably in the 10 year plus range, partly because the capacities, the register sizes needed to uh, satisfy those problems are well beyond what we can, we can uh, fabricate at the moment. So in terms of the physical sciences, the things that we're doing today, here's an example of a nuclear physics problem where we're actually able to solve using a quantum computer. So in this particular example, we're looking to find what is the binding energy of the nucleus of an atom. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the nucleus of the atom has protons in it, can also have neutrons in it. Uh, how much they are uh, favored to, to bind to each other is known as the binding energy. Turns out that's an incredibly important quantity if you're trying to predict the um, uh, potential uh, isotopes of new atoms. So we know, for example, in the plot here of the uh, all the atoms that are known to exist, there's expectation there's a certain island of stability far out in the nuclear number that we're not able to confirm yet because those calculations are much too difficult. We did a small demonstration, the case of Deuteron, the smallest atom possible, where a quantum computer can actually solve that problem and give an accurate prediction of that binding energy. The next step, though, is to scale that up to try and tackle this nuclear stability question. We're doing similar work with high energy physics. Here, quantum chromodynamics is a theory that's extremely complicated and difficult to simulate, in part because of multiple energy and time scales. We're actually looking at low energy processes that are dominated by symmetry breaking, where we can do small examples in which this superposition, this um, distribution of the, the, the possible state can be queried and sampled through the quantum computing methods. In fact, we're able to predict the dynamics of a very simple quantum chromodynamic lattice model. Third application is in applied mathematics. This is using a quantum annealing system to actually solve a polynomial system of equations, something that we know is central to many uh, PDE models. Here, convergence often depends on the condition number of the matrix, and there are many different methods out there using preconditioners and, and whatnot to try to improve that. What we found using quantum annealing is that we can actually achieve similar residual error with, as conventional methods, but independent of the condition number, simply because it's a different approach. So this particular example and all the examples right now are sort of the state of the art and what we're able to do with quantum computing today. Seemingly small demonstrations, but indications of how we can grow over time. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, all of these systems are being accessed through a client-server model. That's not a long-term integration strategy for quantum computing. We know that high-performance computing systems are very sensitive to their design and tuning of parameters and, of course, their architecture. So some of the work we're doing now is envisioning what those architectures may look like in the future. You can see here an example of a node that may end up in a quantum, PC, uh, quantum HPC system. Of course, it has a CPU, a memory, maybe other accelerators. But this QPU can also be an attached device, which can also serve as an accelerator. Now, we've broken that down further into control units, execution units, and of course, the register. But these are just uh, proposed designs at the moment. What really becomes critical is in developing implementation of these ideas. And I'd say that's where the state of the technology is at the moment, trying to find out what's the right balance between system concerns to actually get good performance in this type of device model. But beyond that, we have to think about how do we scale these systems up. We can certainly imagine bringing in one of these cryogenic refrigerators and sitting it down next to my laptop and having a very fast interconnect that allows those two systems to work in, in, in co collaboration with each other, it's sort of this shared memory model. Um, but I think because there is such an emphasis on current uh, technology to try and leverage parallelism in processing large-scale computing applications, we certainly have to imagine the case where in the future, HPC systems have QPUs attached to each node as well. Now, as you can see in this middle design, those QPUs are all independent. Every CPU has access to that processor and can perform whatever workload is present at the moment. But that, in fact, underutilizes quantum, quantum computing. We know that if the quantum QP, if the QPUs can, in fact, have an interconnect between them, in which they're able to send quantum signals back and forth, 
we can not only get better performance, but we can ex ex exponentially grow the speed at which they're able, or the, the size of the problems which they're able to handle. So I guess where I'm going with this is that moving over from a simple idea of a QPU as being attached to a CPU is going to require the same type of concentrated effort it does to design HPC systems today. It's gonna to require a balance between the use case as well as the uh, technology that's actually underlying how information and instructions is being moved around. So when that system is actually put together, of course, we need an idea of an execution model uh, or certainly a programming model for how to, uh, to pass these programs back and forth. And so again, here's our current research on this area. You can see the CPU issues these instructions through the memory system to the QPU, and it's a series of cascading instructions all the way down to the register. Again, what I would emphasize, this is quantum computing at sort of a systems uh, design level. The only place quantum mechanics shows up is actually in the register itself. Everything else you see on this slide is about conventional signaling and transfer of data. Now, of course, there's a hierarchy of languages that support this. At the very top is the programming languages that the users need to be aware of in order to access these devices. And that gets translated into a binary and then an instruction set, and then all the way down into opcodes. But after that, quantum actually requires a new layer called the gate fields. And these are essentially electromagnetic fields that are used to drive the quantum mechanical systems. It can be lasers, it can be uh, microwaves, it can be magnetics. Uh, it depends on the technology. But this layer of abstraction is actually how the, the, the state of the field appears to be gone. To give you an example of how we've applied this particular idea of system architecture, we've looked at a comparison between how quantum computing and a conventional uh, CMOS-based processor would fare doing the same task. And in this case, we actually looked at the task of searching an unstructured database. And my favorite analogy for this is someone calls you on the telephone and you don't know who it is and you have to look them up by name in the telephone book. But of course, all you have is the phone number. It's an incredibly difficult problem. It grows um, with the size of the, uh, the telephone book itself if you're solving this conventionally using brute force. Quantum mechanics actually has an algorithmic advantage here. It gets a square root improvement uh, through something known as Grover's algorithm. When we looked at the systems analysis of how much energy these two systems would use to solve the same problem, we found that the minimum amount of energy in both cases uh, was very sensitive to the size of the system. You can see here the database all the way down from eight bits, something like the ASCII alphabet, up to 128 bits, which is all the IPv6 internet addresses in the world. Searching through that, of course, is a strong dependence on the energy. But more importantly, for the worst case scenario, the difference in energy between these two technologies was on the order of 20 orders of magnitude. Now, this number meant nothing to me. This is like a mega, mega, mega joule. So I actually tried to figure out what was an equivalent physical thing that corresponds to this. And that energy difference is the equivalence of taking the moon from the surface of the Earth and moving it through the atmosphere against the force of gravity and putting it in orbit. I think in this particular case, there's a dozen caveats that I could give you for why this, this calculation shows this difference. But fundamentally, it comes down to the quantum technology itself has an advantage in the amount of information, requir or amount of information required to solve this problem and the amount of energy necessary to do so. So of course, we're trying to train people to get even better understanding of this. Uh, we're looking at uh, classes that we've had at, at, on site. Uh, we're also looking at partnerships with people who have uh, stakes in the development of quantum computing. And then of course, transferring the technology outside the laboratory uh, to our partners and, uh, and others. Coming up at the end of this month, the 25th of April, uh, we have a quantum computing user forum. I'll admit being a little bashful saying that in front of this crowd. I'm not saying I stole the name from somewhere, but I did. Um, its purpose is to bring together the users to discuss common practices, uh, especially applications and software. Uh, it's gonna be a technical conference. Uh, it's certainly open to anybody in this room who may wanna learn more. Uh, finally, there's multiple things going on. Quantum is such a hot topic right now. Uh, there are working groups in software. Uh, the IEEE uh, Futures Directions Committee has started a new quantum initiative. 
Um, this is a, 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 a place where benchmarking is, is showing up. And then, of course, the, the lab, Oak Ridge, also has a newsletter that we send out weekly to keep people updated on this topic. So this is the summary slide. Uh, I, think, I hope I've at least given you some background on what quantum computing is today, uh, why I think it's going to have an impact on scientific discovery. Uh, of course, it's at a very early stage in its development, uh, but in the future, I certainly think that this is a technology that could have an impact on, on this forum and, and others elsewhere. So thank you very much. So you showed quantum chips and everything, but many of the experiments in uh, physics for entanglement with, have been with photons. Is that a possibility for quantum computing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I skipped over one of the slides that actually has um, gone blue again. Oh, there we are. So down here at the bottom is a linear optical chip out of Bristol, uh, United Kingdom. Um, and it's certainly, yeah, you're exactly right, that many demonstrations have used optics, in part because optics is such a mature technology. Optics has a scalability problem, though, and we've known it for a long time. Uh, it's very difficult to detect photons, uh, and then it's very difficult to make photons interact with each other. They're still being very clever uh, ideas on how to get around that. So, so I haven't counted it out yet, but, uh, but that's one of the issues. Yeah, hi, Travis. That was a really good talk. And I just want to give a quick plug because you under uh, stressed it, that QCI newsletter that makes my Sunday afternoons. <laughs> so if you, just, if you just subscribe to that newsletter and just kind of look through the articles, you get, you get a real good heads of what's going on. So I well, think that, that's, that, a, that's, that's a real value. That's the best endorsement I could have hoped for, Rob. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, so the other thing is, you know, you mentioned a bunch of different uh, hardware you know, uh, methodologies, uh, you know, trapped ions, uh, superconducting. Do you have a favorite one uh, that you think it shows the most promise? Or do you think that there's a potential that there's something else out there that we haven't even thought about yet that may ultimately become the, the hardware base of choice in, say, in 10 years out or so? Yeah, so great question. So um, I myself don't have a favorite technology. Um, you know, as a user, I want whatever technology is going to satisfy the, the problem I have at hand. And what we can see right now is that the different technologies can all be uh, used in different ways to solve different sets of problems. So this is what I meant earlier, when there's no common baseline at the moment. Um, it's still too early for that. But I absolutely think that it's also still too early to say these are the only technologies that are going to be important. Um, many of these technologies are actively controlled systems. So these gate fields that I'm sending in are actually coming from signal generators that are being driven. There are approaches that have been um, conceptualized, the topological approach, that is intrinsically resilient to noise that could come in those systems. And so people are trying for that, but we haven't seen it yet. So fingers crossed. Uh, thank you for the good talk. In one of the slides, you show that people uh, can use quantum annealer to achieve the same error residual as classic computer. So how about the performance? And my next question is, there was one paper says there will always be ways um, to optimize for a classical computer that outperform the uh, quantum annealer. So do, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so for first question, uh, we do have a paper out. It's on archive. It has not been peer reviewed yet, so it's probably right. Um, but but if you if you want, it's at the top there. You can check it out. This is data from that from that uh, result. What I'll show you in the top right here is the dashed line is actually the theoretical residual of error for a conventional method, and then the red uh, hash marks are the actual error we observed with the quantum computer. And then you can see as the rank of the matrix increases, they're more or less the same. What I don't have on here is that if we change the bits of precision required in the solution, moving from somewhere from 8 up to 16, we do see the residual error increase significantly for the quantum annealing method. And so this kind of gives us an insight that the controllability of that system has, has, has reached its limit. And so I think that these are promising results, but there's a, there's a lot more to be done. In terms of can you ever, um, can you always outperform quantum annealing with a conventional method, 
I don't agree with this. Um, there, this is, first, it's an open question, um, even the people who have argued whether you can, that certain models of optimization should be, um, should be efficient both for quantum and classical methods. That, that's the gist of the argument. First off, there are models of optimizations that we know are not efficient for classical optimizations and can be for quantum. Uh, these are what are known as non-stoichastic Hamiltonians. Um, for the opposite case, the stoichastic Hamiltonians, it's still open question whether quantum can outperform uh, the classical methods all the time, or vice versa. So, so yeah, so I, I don't feel comfortable being definitive about that. Hi, you mentioned the, uh, the challenges of orchestrating the classic CPU to uh, quantum exchange and back again. Are there, are there low-hanging fruit 25-meter targets that you're looking at that you're seeing as being the likeliest avenues of approach over the next five years? Or is it, we'll just see what pops up with research? No, great question. So in terms of low-hanging fruits for, um, for the controllability aspect, um, and this is the integration of the CPU and QPU, right? Uh, there has been some work in actually moving the, the conventional processing into the refrigerator. So you can design um, conventional circuits that either are using superconducting technology or possibly silicon that would actually exist in these cryogenic temperatures, which are milli kelvins. Uh, that's 10 times colder than the dark side of the moon, right? Um, so it's not just as easy as dropping one in. There's a lot of engineering that goes on there. I think that that is going to be essential for moving forward for these schemes that are requiring active control of the system. Um, so I think that's a, a it, it's so much, not so much low hanging, but it's the most obvious target uh, to go after. So. So yeah, so I was fascinated by the earlier talk this morning, the thermodynamics computation one, um, because I think that uh, this is exactly one of the engineering challenges for these cryogenic systems is I can only send in so many signals because I'm adding heat to that system that eventually I, I'm destroying my calculation myself. And so I've got to come up with an optimal way of controlling the system and also pumping out the energy that I'm, that I'm putting in there.